It's what happens when you get slightly out of order. First of all, church family, thank you so much. It is wonderful to be home. And um, it's a long way to Calgary um, when you're driving. And uh, I have promised Chris that uh, next time we're flying. So I want to say to my children who may be watching, good to see you. Uh, Love you lots. Looking forward to seeing you soon again. But uh, until uh, we jumped in the car two days ago and came came on down, uh, we we you know did not remember how long it was to come back down to this wonderful place called Santa Clarita. Just want you to know that um, there are many wonderful and beautiful places in the world. And each place has its own, its own beauty, its own uh, panache, if you like. And uh, definitely the Santa Clarita Valley. When I, when I tell people, I, I don't know if you like Magic Mountain, but I ask people, do you know where Magic Mountain is? And if they've ever been down I-5 and they've ever seen those big roller coasters, then they know where we live. So it's kind of easy that way when you're talking to somebody who may have only been driving I-5 down into L.A. uh, to give them an idea of where we live. I wanted to talk this morning about the wolf and the lamb. And so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell it to you differently, and then we're going to look for some lessons from what happened the fact is that our, our Bible is written for us to, to learn all kinds of things. And, and what we learn is what was intended, first of all, for the audience that, that it was written to. Okay, And that audience, in this case, was the people that lived in the days of Isaiah. Now, if you go to what Jesus says... He often quotes Isaiah. And you heard a couple of verses, both at the beginning of the call to worship and then at the text that was read, which was the finishing of the piece of scripture that we're looking at today, that may have rung a bell with you. He says in verse 17 of the 65th chapter, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, the former things will not remember, be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Ra- raise your hand if A, these came from Matthew, B, these came from John, or C, these came from some other book in the Bible. Uh, who, think, who thinks Matthew used these words? How about John? Well, did John write Revelation? Okay, so if I'd said these words you've heard before in the book of Revelation, you would have all raised your hand and said, yes, I know that. But John wrote these words, and here we find that he is quoting the prophet Isaiah, who is under inspiration by God, just like John was under inspiration by God, and he is saying to him, behold, I am going to make all things New. I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things are passed away. This month, I'm hoping that we can learn a few lessons along with the Old Testament people, or maybe a few lessons that were meant to be learned by the people in the Old Testament. We think often about the fact that we are New Testament people, that we, we have the, the ability to, to think about grace instead of law. Well, I'm happy to tell you that grace and law are in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so as we look today at the Old Testament, particularly the book of Isaiah, I'm hoping that you will hear that, that you will catch a vision for that as well. Isaiah says that the the text that Kit so ably read was, Before they call, I will answer, and while they are still speaking, I will hear. I'm hoping today that that 
you will be able to grab a hold of the, the idea that God will protect you. God will strengthen you and that God will empower you. I have a testimony that some of you have already heard and I'm going to share it with you because I, uh, I don't want anything bad to happen to you either. So there are a few lessons that you will learn from my testimony today which I may make plain to you. Recently, not on this trip, but the trip that I took over my fifth Sabbath, um, I rented a car. And uh, some of you are saying, oh, I've done that. Um, go to an airport. In this case, it was Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport's the biggest, most busy airport in the United States now. And uh, I rented a car. It was very early in the morning when I got there, and the car that my wife had uh, picked for me, um, the little easy rent-a-car place did not have any cars. And so, uh, not wanting to wait for the other five people in front of me to receive cars before me and then to be told there were no more cars, I went upstairs to Enterprise. And I'm going to use names here because uh, I'd, I'd like to give credit where credit is due. Enterprise had cars. Uh, it's nice to know that just down the street from me on uh, my, my street uh, is the Enterprise rent-a-car place, and I'm going to use them again if that gives you any idea of my experience. Enterprise had a car. Uh, I made the deal, right? Actually, my wife made the deal on the computer while she was talking to me, and as I got up to the counter, the joys of technology, the deal was already on the computer of the person that I talked to. It's pretty cool. I get the car. It's early in the morning. I'm supposed to drive up to, to see my relatives to stay overnight, just a little while. I get in the car. It's a nice little uh, Hyundai Elantra. It's a good little car. I was enjoying it. I'm driving carefully. It's, you, know, you don't want to stick out in the middle of the night. This is when cops really are looking for people. So I was careful with my driving, except that when I got to where 85 and 75 split, I went the wrong way. I said to myself, I'm not going to want to spend the time to go up and around. And so I pulled off to the side of the road. As I pulled off to the side of the road, I went over, I'm not kidding now, a chunk of concrete that happened to be on the side of the road, which... In my haste to get off to the side of the road, I did not see. And as I bumped sort of halfway up on that very jaggedy piece of concrete, it ripped a hole in the side of my tire. I hear this, pss, it's not just a little, pss, it's a, pss. so I know that in literally a few seconds, I am now going to have a flat tire. I decided that was really silly to get off the road like that. And I was repentant, but I knew that I had a choice. I could either get on my phone or I could get outside and change the tire. That's what I did, change the tire. And in that moment, I'm talking to my wife and I'm saying, I think I'm going to go back to the airport since I'm so close here and I'm going to trade my car in because I don't want to you know, have to take care of this tire in some other town. That was a very, very good decision. I believe it was inspired. And I went back to the airport and I pulled in and I said to the two young ladies who happened to probably be in their early 20s, I said, uh, look, this is what has happened. I, I, I had this flat at the top of, of Atlanta. I brought the car back because I, I just don't want to have to deal with it. They said, sir, that's really kind of you to bring the car back. We're going to take $50 off your rental. I mean, this was going well already, all right? <laughs> And I said, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I went ahead and uh, got a new car. Uh, in this case, though, very important part of the fact, that the, the story that you need to know is, I did not choose that car. I chose the Elantra before, but I did not choose the next car that I was given. Young, one young lady was doing the paperwork or the computer work, and the other young lady went up to another level in the car park and brought down a Chevy Impala. 
Now, this is the biggest car that Chevy makes now. And she chose it for me. And she chose it for me for my protection. Protection from the police. The other choice was a bright red Ford Focus. And she said, no, I don't want to give you that car because cops you know, will see you too easily and you know, more likely give you a ticket. And I was very thankful. It was very kind of her to be thinking of my good as a renter. And she gave me this, you know, this car that really was an upgrade from what I had before, but it was one of only two cars that were left in the Enterprise fleet at that moment. Now, no complaining. When I got into the car, it smelled like somebody had disobeyed the huge big sticker on the dash that says, no smoking. Somebody had decided this was not for them and that they could smoke all they wanted in that car. But I thought, you know what? They gave this car to me because they were taking care of me. No comment. I just drove out and I went to stay with my relatives. I took care of the business that I needed to take care of in uh, both Tennessee for my mom. And then I went and visited my mom uh, on that Friday. And we moved her from one facility to another. My mom is is in that time of her life where she needs to be in a uh, facility that cares for her needs and gives her her food and that sort of thing. And she's doing well. I want you to know it was a very good move and she's doing very well. And we're very pleased that uh, this is the situation now. I spent the Sabbath with my brother. It was very nice. Went to see my mom some more. But that night I had to drive back to Atlanta because I was catching a 6 a.m. flight to the next part of my journey. And so I thought, I'm going to give in my car at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to catch my flight, and it's going to be fine. If I have to, I can just park somewhere and take a few winks in the car. And I'm thinking, this is great. I have this huge, big Impala. I can even stretch out in the back seat. This is going to be wonderful. But you know, the deal you make with uh, rental cars is that you have to fill it up if you don't prepay. And uh, cheap as I am sometimes, I had decided to go ahead and fill it up myself instead of paying their price for gas. I left the airport because I'd gone all the way back to the airport and I went back out and I knew that there were a couple of places I could get off and I, I got off the interstate and went down a dark street, turned into a gas station that was fairly well lit. It also had a a washer terrier beside it, and there were numbers of people who were loitering around the, the gas station at night. There were several cars parked off, and I don't know. I, I guess I need to tell you that I did have a sense of foreboding, but I, I just thought, you know, this is, this is fine. I'll just get my gas and go. Well, I had everything on the side passenger seat, that I had brought, and, and I'd been very good. I just brought one jump bag and my my uh, uh, bag for my Bible and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so there wasn't much. Took out my credit card, got out of the car, went around and did the gas thing, and I was now standing putting gas in my car. Now, mind you, I'm dressed in shorts and a shirt, Socks, shoes, I'm putting gas in my car. Until my car started moving. And then it started peeling out of the gas station. And at that point, I'm left with the gas going in my hand. And I'm about two or three seconds into this situation. I was so shocked that I just dropped the gas nozzle on the ground and started yelling, it's a rental! I'm a pastor! It's a rental! And then started yelling to those around me, my car is being stolen. And that's what was happening. I was being carjacked. Okay? Out of the corner of my eye, I now remember seeing the flash or seeing the, the streak of a person coming out, as I'm somewhat looking to the rear of the car, I see this streak come between the two other gas pumps and into my car, and in that split second, start the car up and speed away, having then been followed by another 
vehicle, a Honda Accord. Well, I'm 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 just I'm I'm yelling at the top of my voice at this point. I am I am uh, uh, you know realizing I have nothing. I have a credit card. You know you know how Mastercard says that that's for everything else. Well, let me tell you, when you're standing in a parking lot at 12:30 in the morning, and all you have is your shorts and your shirt and your shoes and a credit card, you don't really feel like you have anything. Um, the gentleman that was sitting in front of the gas station jumped up. He started calling 911. He was on the phone. It happened to be that the Haintville police were right there. They were on the job, and not only one car, but two cars came, and the second car immediately began chasing, and a chase was initiated, and... I was left to become the victim. I don't know if you've ever been called the victim. But it hasn't happened to me very often. A uh, pretty big kid in school going over to England. I was almost two years older than most kids in my class, so if you look at my photographs, I matured faster than most of the other boys because I was almost two years older. And so at one point, I was almost head and shoulders taller than all the rest of the guys in my class. And so that's pretty helpful to a guy's self-esteem if he's going through school and he's the biggest guy, okay? There's not a lot of people who could mess with me. No, uh, even more than that, the, you know, you, you, you end up being the protector of the little guys who also get picked on. You don't expect, when you've lived that kind of life, you don't expect to be called the victim. So this was, this was a, a, a very, very new feeling for me in, in its entirety. I was in shock, uh, uh, and, and I'm telling you that the, the uh, police women, the police personnel that took care of me did an incredibly wonderful job. Officer Dyer, Margaret Dyer, was so professional, so amazing. She just calmed me down and she started taking down my information. What happens when you're in shock is that you often don't remember things. Add to that the fact that we put all of our telephone numbers on our phones. Amen? amen. Say amen if you do this. Okay, if you said amen, I'm now going to tell you not to do this. You're going to need to memorize some numbers. Because I could not remember my wife's telephone number. I could not remember much of anything. Okay? We stood there for a while, and she's talking on the radio. We're listening to the... They're listening to the police chase in their earphones, and I'm listening to the updates that they're giving. And I want you to know that at that moment, I said to them something which I had faith in at that moment. I am going to get back all my stuff. Because this Bible has been with me since my ordination. Okay, it has all kinds of notes, pictures, all kinds of really important stuff to me. It was probably the most valuable thing in my possession at the time of all my possessions being taken. What I had forgotten was that I also had my passport. You know that I have just come home from Canada from my vacation. I would not have been able to go to Canada if my passport had been taken, if it had been discovered, because passports are pretty valuable things to take from people, again, a warning about protection of your things. I get in the back of the police car. I don't know how many of you have had a ride in the back of a police car. <laughs> I have not until a few weeks ago. Uh, it is a plastic seat meant to not be comfortable, but to be very functional. And uh, there are a few holes, so I could still hear what Officer Dyer was saying as she took me to police headquarters. 
I sat there. Um, she was able to bring me up on the California driver's license registration. So uh, there was a picture there, and that was probably the only piece of ID that they could get a hold of. The sergeant started working on the Internet. What did I feel at that moment? I felt, how do I prove my identity? You've got a card that says your name, but it doesn't have a picture. Now, I know there are some credit cards that can put your picture on it, and that's not a bad idea. Okay? Sitting there, how, how do you prove? Once you know that I've taken precautions about my Facebook. So it was very hard. In fact, she couldn't find me on Facebook. She couldn't find my wife. She couldn't find my daughter. We went to the Santa Clarita Seventh-day Adventist Church Facebook site. Still no, no help as far as a picture. So we went to the website. And I want to thank my friends who have helped make sure that the website is up to date because they went on to one of the programs like we're doing right now. And guess what I was doing? I was baptizing someone. I was baptizing my first baptism in this church. Do you know that John came up to me two weeks after I got here and said, I want to be your first baptism. And he was. Doesn't have to be my last, let me tell you. I'm looking forward to the next time we have to use baptistry. And we can use the baptistry, but hey, now you know we can use anything that has water in it. I sat there, and they were listening to the chase. And then the word came back. They caught the Honda. It was pretty banged up because the driver wasn't very good, and it smashed into several other cars. I waited, and pretty soon the flatbed with the Honda came to the police station. At this point, they come to me and they say, we've lost, we've lost your car. And I'm thinking, God, I need to get on that plane at 6 o'clock. I have all my stuff in that car. It's yours. You know where the car is. I tell you what came back at that moment was... You have a Chevy. You have an impo you have a GM product and it has OnStar. So, kudos to GM, kudos to OnStar. I told Officer Dyer, I said, my car has OnStar. She gets on the phone immediately with Enterprise. Enterprise says, you know, verifies that I'm the renter and that this is the police and, and they get on to the OnStar. They are able to shut down the car with OnStar. Just like they're able to start it up. They can shut it down. They found that it had already been stable behind a set of apartments. They knew the coordinates. They gave the coordinates to the police. And so the police were able to hone right in on that car. They went, I'm sure, very carefully to get that car. But when they found the car, all that they found outside the car was the stuff that was in my shaving kit. They put it back in, the sh in, in, in my shaving kit, threw my shaving kit back in the car, and then called the flatbed. Folks, I got all my stuff back. I got this Bible back. God answered my prayer. But here's how it goes with the text today. What does the text say in verse 24? Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. God knew, and this is my testimony to you today, God knew that I was going to need this car. And so he took the Elantra away. I don't know if some angel put that piece of concrete there, but let me tell you, it was full size, that thick, that big, and it ripped a big hole in my tire. So that I went back and got the car that I would need because that was what was going to happen to me. And to get all my stuff back, you need OnStar. Or whatever else you want to put in the back of your car, low jack, whatever it is that people are using these days in order to make sure that they can get their cars back if they get stolen. 
Officer Dyer put me in the back of her car a second time. <laughs> Law says I'm not allowed to ride up front unless I have permission. So I'm in the back of the car now with all my stuff, with the exception, by the way, of my cell phone. Now I know some of you are saying, oh my goodness, I, I, that would have been the most devastating thing to lose my cell phone. Well, here's the learnings. They're coming thick and fast now. You ready? Back your cell phone up. <laughs> so if I call you, or if you call me, and I ask you to tell me who you are, and it won't happen because my good friend Amy, my secretary, has now downloaded the entire church membership onto my new phone. So it won't happen to most of you, but some of you have not been part of that list. And so if you call me and I say, who's this? Just know that I'm repopulating my phone, that I, I've had that phone list for 17 years. I've lost a lot of phone numbers, pictures, because... I didn't back my phone up. If you have an Apple, it goes to the cloud. cloud. If you have Google, a Gmail, and you have an Android, it goes to your Gmail. That's how they do it these days. So if you don't think that you're that smart with a phone, please do that first grade type thing and make sure that on your phone, the backup is turned on so that if ever you lose your phone for whatever reason, or it's taken from you, make sure that your stuff is backed up and they can put it onto a new phone. Second, buy the insurance. Okay, It's not very expensive when you buy your phone, buy the insurance. Because there's a secondary company that will then sell you a phone at a fraction of the cost of what your phone would cost to replace. Okay, So that's the learning. The the bigger learning, though, has to do with when you're filling up gas. You ready? Here's what you do. You take the keys out of the car. <laughs> the police call this action, they've got a name for it, they call it a slider. Now you think you're talking baseball, but no, you're talking what this guy did. He opened my door and he slid into my car, turned the car on, and drove away with it. Okay, when you're getting gas, take the keys out of the ignition and put them in your pocket. Now you think, I always do that. I well, I don't. Okay? I well, I didn't. I didn't because now I do. Okay? Some would say close the door and lock it. Okay? If you if you feel that that's the security that you need, do it. So those are the those are the practical learnings from 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 my experience, and and I want you I want you to learn them as well because I don't want this to ever happen to you either. Okay. Now he probably also liked my car, so if you have a car that the police say is on the list of cars that people like to take, understand that and take the proper precautions. Some of us have cars that nobody really wants. Okay. All right, and, and I understand that, but just understand that this, this does happen. And uh, Officer Dyer did admit to me that there had been other incidents of a similar nature at that gas station. So uh, I, I, I am very thankful for the police force at Hapeville, that's H-A-P-E, Hapeville, Georgia. Uh, never heard of it. Uh, I want to go back. The headquarters for Porsche in North America are in Hapeville, Georgia. Uh, along with several other major automobile companies, they have a five square mile town, and someday I will be back to say thank you again to the police force at Hapeville. We took a picture. I'm going to email Officer Dyer and ask for uh, that picture to be sent to my email. And uh, there's four of us. There's the two police that we're chasing, and then Officer Dyer and the sergeant that night that uh, took care of me. And I tell you what, uh, you know, here you have a, a situation where a young lady gives me a car that she is hoping will help me to avoid the police. <laughs> okay? And yeah, nobody wants a ticket. All right? <laughs> but then I end up encountering the police, and they are very much 
to my rescue and to, to, to getting back all of my stuff and, and, and they're helped by the technology that exists uh, in the GM products that, that are out there on the road known as OnStar. Uh, before I knew that I would need that car, God provided that car for me. And I want you to know that the irony is that when I got to my next stop, which was to be in Boston for all of 24 hours so that I could represent my family at a family wedding, I rented another car. Guess what they gave me? A Chevy Impala. <laughs> and it was the midnight blue Chevy Impala. So I thought, God, you, have a, you, you really have a sense of, of humor here. You are taking care of me super well on this trip. You're just giving me only one kind of car, and you're saying, I'm going to take care of you. I have you here. Don't worry. You're going to be able to do what you need to do, which I did. I finished the trip. I came back, but you can imagine that my wife was not very pleased when uh, I did get a telephone call at the end of that week about two and a half weeks ago saying that a friend of mine had passed away in Ohio and they wanted me to come and do the funeral. So, not that it, most of you know this, but on that Thursday after I got back, I jumped on another plane and flew to Akron, Ohio and buried my friend Leslie. Jumped on a plane that same night and came home. Didn't rent a car. <laughs> was driven to and from the airport by my friends in their Honda. So just know that God is ready and willing to protect us, to bless us, to empower us. He is, he's going he's gonna to do this not because he is any more uh, uh, upset with any one of us. And in fact, he wants to do this for all of us. He wants us all to be able and interested in, in following him and being a part of, of his family. The reason that I chose the picture on the front of your bulletin this morning, well, actually this week, I, I, Amy, again, just super, super wonderful person to work with, and uh, she chooses great pictures. And if you look at that picture, you can say, wow, um, that's not natural. And you know, it's not natural in this world in which we live. It's not natural for a predator to lie down with its prey. When we see it, we say to ourselves, that, that's going to happen someday when God changes everything. And so what I'm, what I'm wanting you to, 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 to hear from the lesson from the Old Testament today is that the God of the Old Testament was telling his people, someday it's going to be different. Someday the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb. The lion is going to eat grass like the ox. Someday the predator and the prey are going to be side by side with each other in my kingdom. Now, I, I, I don't know about you, but there's some people that I'm not sure I want to be in heaven. But God be praised, my friends. He wants everyone. He wants the man who stole my car. He wants it. And he wants me. The wolf stole my car. I felt like a, a, a helpless little lamb. And guess what? They both end up in the kingdom of God. By his grace, by his power, by his decision. How's that? How, how, how does that sit with you? Wow, I, I, I never, I never want to be a victim again. And if you've been a victim, I know you never want to be a victim again. You would rather be the one who is bigger, who's able to take care of yourself, who's able to fend off all the predators in your life. I've got news for you. You're not big enough. 
You're not big enough to take care of all of those predators in your life. You are going to need protection. And I've got to tell you that the Bible says, you ready? Before you ask for protection, I've got it for you. Before you feel like a victim, I already have the answer to your problem. Question is, my friends, are we actually asking him for help? Are we wanting to be part of his kingdom? I'm looking forward to this day. It's going to be, it's going to be such a shock. It's going to be such a shock. But you know, my Jesus, my leader asks me to pray for my car thief. Because my Jesus loves him. And wants him home with him. Because you know what? He's a human being for which Jesus put the plan of salvation into action. He is someone who God died for. And even though he was acting in that way on that night. On whoever's instructions. Maybe some car thieving ring had told him you better come back with a car tonight because you know what the Honda was stolen as well so if both of them had gotten away they would have both gotten home with a stolen vehicle and whoever was paying them to do that would have paid them and then and then they would have gone on with their lives stealing cars but that person whoever it was that put it up put them up to it didn't get what they wanted By the way, that person, Jesus loves them too. That kingpin, that gang leader, whomever it is, Jesus loves them too. Jesus loves all the wolves, the predators. And now the tough part. I think we've all been predators. We've all decided, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm big enough, I can take care of myself. And we've said no to God. And maybe it takes a situation like what I went through where I get to be called the victim. Maybe it takes that to to jog us loose and say, you know what? You are always going to be the victim if you do not have protection. So I, I guess my simple request for you today is trust Jesus. Trust Him that He has got you. Trust Him to provide for you the things that you need to live in His kingdom, which is in the valley of the shadow of death right now. Trust Him. Because guess what? He already knows your future. He already knows what you will need. We like to think we do, but no, we don't. He he knows. He knows. And as long as we keep telling ourselves, He knows what I need. He knows my future. I'm going to trust Him. My friends, we're invincible. talking to my friend this morning 91 years raise your hand dear 91 okay on this world 91 years is that a short time or a long time short right she's not sure she's ready for it to be over Do you know how she knows that it's not time to be over yet? Because she knows, she knows that God still has a work for her to do. So if you trust God to give you the reason for why you're alive, then he is certainly going to protect you and he's going to tell you what's next. I'm telling you folks, that's really, really a wonderful place to be. 
Because in this tumultuous world in which we live right now, it is really good to know where we're going. And it's really good to know that we have protection. And it's really good to know that we have some, well, we have the God of the universe who is ready, willing, and able to provide for all of our needs and all of the needs of our family. And he is doing so because he knows that by working together with us and us cooperating with him, that there will be other people in our circle of influence who will also come to know that he loves them too. Even if they're the ones who steal your car. So I just want to thank you for letting me tell you that story today. And I want to say to you, I'm looking forward to the day in which the lion will eat grass like the ox and in which the wolf will lie down with the lamb. Amen? Amen. Amen.